Good afternoon and uh, welcome, uh, welcome everyone. My name is Paulo Pereira. Uh, I'm a professor of uh, international relations and uh, coordinator of the Drug Policy International Research Group of the Transnational Security Studies Center at the Pontifical Catholic University of Sao Paulo, PUC Sao Paulo, Brazil. We are one of the organizers of this event together with the International Development Policy Journal the Global Commission on Drug Policy and the Professional Master in Global Governance of PUC São Paulo also. The event is being recorded and uh, will be later posted uh, on Development Policy Journal websites. The questions you may, you may have during the presentation uh, should be submitted via the question and answer feature and uh, a satisfaction survey will be sent out after the event. We'll be glad if you can answer it for us. Thank you. Well, uh, I'm happy uh, you were able to attend this activity at the end of our academic term. Although it's already December of this pandemic year, uh, painful for everyone, for sure, we are here in an um, online room full of people uh, students, professors, and professionals interested in talking about drug policies. I think uh, this expresses the growing importance of this theme internationally and uh, also for Brazil. In fact, uh, I'd say particularly for Brazil, a country that, like so many others in Latin America, has experienced over the last decades several types of violence related to drugs. Uh, this violence arises from drug prohibition, most often with uh, racist approaches, but also from its consequent illicit market. And mainly, for sure, from the repressive policies of the state that kill, imprison, impoverish, sicken, and weaken communities in the countryside and in the city. Well, certainly this must change. And uh, that's why I'm uh, happy to organize this event to present some of the findings uh, of the special issue, Drug Policy and Development, Conflict and Coexistence, launched by the International Development Policy Journal. And also to have experts, uh, two colleagues here, to, that can bring a Brazilian perspective on this issue. The, the proposal to debate drugs from a development perspective and not just from the perspective of violence, for me, uh, is instigating. Um, this change of lens immediately highlights important aspects of these policies. It reminds us, for example, that these special commodities, drugs, they have a long story and this story has been marked by prohibition, it's true, but uh, it's not limited to it. One uh, of the main objectives of international drug control in the 20th century was to organize this expanding global market to ensure supply and availability of certain drugs while others were banned, which responded to interests of relevant international and private actors. Well, uh, the countries most affected by these prohibitions are in the global south, like us, like Brazil. Uh, we are still the main producers of agricultural-based drugs that have had the greatest restrictions under international control. They are cannabis, cocaine, and opium. And that's exactly why this change of lanes is so fundamental for these countries. Looking at such drugs from a development perspective makes it possible to envisage more peaceful, more uh, ethical, healthier, and maybe more profitable paths for the communities most affected by drug repression in the global south. Brazil is an important world producer of cannabis, a plant that has been the focus of racist criminalization since the slavery period, and the country has maintained 
the same approach with different characteristics, of course, but until today. And now, under Bolsonaro government, any progressive drug policy, whether about cannabis or, or any other drug, uh, is under constant threat, for sure. But um, incredibly, there are lots of people that remain working collectively on a daily basis to change this scenario. And between advances and setbacks, it's being changed for good, or at least um, I think so. Putting drugs in a development perspective, I think is in line with this effort, but demands uh, an even more propositional stance from the global south that can break the remaining international prejudices and stereotypes. It can uh, create new policies, question old models, discuss the standards for evaluating drug policies. And uh, I think above all, uh, maybe it can involve the communities most affected by the war on drugs in this whole process. This is, this is a change that involves the production of knowledge and uh, maybe the universities have a lot to contribute in this regard, but it involves also political articulations and pressures, convincing others, and uh, certainly it involves clashes also. Well, this event is a small part of this effort, expressing the new approach in which the drug policy debate can and uh, should take place especially in countries like ours and other countries in the global south. Well, uh, just to finish, I'd like to thank Claudia Marconi, coordinator of our professional master's degree in global governance and a moderator of this event. And also, of course, uh, to thank the speakers, uh, Khalid Nasti, Joanne Kizet, uh, Luis Guilherme Paiva, and Andrea Galassi, who will be duly introduced next by, by Claudia. Well, I hope this is the first of many activities uh, in which we can uh, think about this urgent topic, exchanging local, national, and uh, international experiences, and uh, reflecting on impossible and ethical ways to, to deal with drugs. Uh, this is a global challenge for sure, in which we need to think and act collectively. So thank you again for being with us. And now I think we shall start the panel itself. So Claudia, uh, you can go ahead. Okay, thank you so much, Paulo. Thank you for your initial opening remarks. I would also like to thank our audience for joining this online panel and this digital uh, conversation. I'll be chairing this session, as Paulo uh, said. And as your moderator, I have some responsibilities here. First of them, I must properly introduce our huge speakers. Uh, we are uh, really excited to have them here together in this panel addressing the nexus and frictions of development and drug uh, policy. Unfortunately, I also have the task of controlling their time. Uh, the agreed time was from six to seven minutes for their oral intervention. Um, so I know it is uh, too short especially considering their robust trajectories and repertoires on the subject matter of this panel. But the ideal is exactly that of installing a discussion and make you all go through the 12th thematic issue of international development policy and uh, uh, its articles and uh, contributions. After listening to them, we shall have at least a brief session of Q&A. Uh, so I would kindly ask our audience to put your questions in your Zoom chat box, okay? I will try to select some of them and ask for our uh, speakers to react. 
to them. If your question is directly posed to any of them, please let me also know uh, through the chat, okay? So I will, um, I will introduce our speakers following the, uh, the previously agreed order in our program, starting by uh, Khalid Tinasti. So welcome, uh, Khalid. Uh, Khalid Tinasti is the director of the Global Commission on Drug Policy and a research and teaching fellow at the Global Studies Institute at the University of Geneva. He holds a PhD in political science from the Catholic University of Paris and has held research fellowships at the Graduate Institute, Switzerland and Swansea University, UK. Khalid is the author of both many uh, scientific papers and policy reports with a focus on public policies, democracy and the role of elections and international drug control mechanisms. And he's one of the co-editors of this 12th thematic issue of international development policy. So welcome, we are really happy to have you here. Uh, our next uh, guest is Andrea Galassi. Andrea Galassi is an occupational therapist. She has her master and PhD degree from the Faculty of Medicine at USP, University of Sao Paulo, and postdoc from the Center for Addiction and Mental Health at the University of Toronto, Canada. She's an associate professor at the University of Brazilian. So now I'm dealing with a storm here. I am so sorry. <laughs> She's an associate professor at the University of Brasilia and general coordinator of the Reference Center on Drugs and Associated Vulnerabilities at the same UNIB. Welcome, Andrea. Uh, our next uh, oral intervention will come from Luis Guilherme Paiva. Welcome, Luis. Luis is co-founder and senior researcher at the Sao Paulo-based Center for the Study of Liberty and Authoritarianism, the so-called LAUT. Holds a PhD in criminal law from the University of Sao Paulo and is a regular contributor to International Drug Policy and Criminal Justice Fora and research centers. Between 2015 and 2016, he was secretary for drug policy at the Ministry of Justice of Brazil, where he coordinated the Brazilian position for the UNGAS, uh, UN General Assembly Special Session on the World Drug Problem to 2016 process. Recently, he was an associate researcher at the Center for International Drug Policy at the London School of Economics and Drug Policy Coordinator at the Brazilian Institute for Criminal Science. So welcome again, Luiz. And last but not least, uh, it's a pleasure to receive Joanne Cassette. Professor Joanne Cassette is an Associate Professor of Population and Family Health at the Columbia University Mayo Manny School of Public Health in New York where she directs the program in health and human rights. She was the founding director. She was the founding director uh, of the HIV and human rights program at Human Rights Watch and the executive director of the Canadian HIV AIDS Legal Network. She has written widely on drug control policy and access to health services for criminalized population. So this will be the sequence of the oral interventions of our uh, panelists. So um, if I could just ask something for our audience to keep your cams off and your microphones muted in order to deliver you know, a good recording of this event to the uh, website of International Policy Development Journal afterwards. So thank you, Khalid, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Through the chat, I will advise you when there is one minute missing, okay? Six to seven minutes. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Claudia. And um, it is an honor to be with everyone in this incredible panel that you have put together. I am very, very grateful to be part of the speakers here. Uh, I must just start taking a minute by reminding that it's always a very special emotion to speak uh, with colleagues from Brazil. Of course, the Global Commission on Drug Policy was founded by former President Fernando Henrique Cardoso. 
and has been based for many, many years and been operationalized from the Igarape Institute based in Rio de Janeiro. So we have a very close link with Brazil. So it's always a very emotional, of course, uh, to be speaking to you. Unfortunately, all I can say is boa tarde, but um, that's, <laughs> that's already it. <laughs> so thank you very much. And just very briefly before I speak about uh, more about the article that I had the opportunity to write in, in, in this paper, just to give the rationale for the special issue with the journal International Development Policy. Of course, we have been very lucky with the, my co-editors, uh, Professor Julia Buxton from the University of Manchester and uh, Dr. Mary Chinari Hesse from the University of Ghana to find an open access journal that had the expertise in development policies to welcome this discussion and, and to include the discussion on drug policy. It was for us also a way to build or to renew the existing literature to some extent and to update it uh, and get in the best authors that we could find in their specialization. And I'm extremely happy to have with us, of course, tonight, Professor Joan Sete, who has given us a wonderful article on, on drug policy and public health, uh, but that we will see later. We had also the opportunity to have people like David Mansfield, who gave us a paper on alternative development in Afghanistan, and Julia Buxton herself on drug policy and development. The issue was that really we had to look in a way, as Paolo was saying, into how to address the unintended consequences, what is still called 12 years later, after they've been identified, the unintended consequences of the international control regime, those negative consequences on poverty alleviation, on good health, on safe cities, on international aid that goes into supply reduction and into human rights violations rather than going into better programming. And so it was a way to really look into these real issues and the commitments of countries into, these, into alleviating and into sustainable development to some extent and how drug policy, this unseen, uncared for, but very costly policy is actually hindering those objectives that society and governments and all the branches of government are trying to, to, to stick to. So we have been very fortunate, of course, to have the special issue. And uh, I think um, Martin will put in the access, the link to the access please, Martha, to, uh, to the special issue, which is, as I said, open access, and that is very lucky. And we thank the journal, of course, for giving us this opportunity. What it brought also now what the, to, to get into the article and the discussion in the article is that we have added also a dimension of what we call uh, drug policies and human development to look into the issues that are not looked into very much directly in in international drug policy. We had an interview with the Nobel Peace Prize and former president of Timor-Leste, who has been also the representative of the UN Secretary General into Guinea-Bissau, Mr. Ramos Horta, who told us about a situation of why, why he refused to call a narco state. We looked also into the uh, drug policy into in a, a conflict situation and the impact of the illicit financial fl flows, which is which are not looked into, into that situation, and we added this dimension of looking into drug policies and politics, and that is the article I have worked on, which was really to link drug policies with. Uh, the neo-patrimonial nature of some regimes. I'm very, very happy to speak here because I know that uh, Luis Guillaume Paiva is here and I'm very happy to hear his presentation also and his views on this. So the idea was that, to, that, created, that, that was behind this article called the neo-patrimonial use of drug policy in electoral processes was to really look into how drug policy is used to influence political political competition and political participation. Going from the very perspective of what does drug policy mean uh, or how was it implemented in what we would call the production and transit countries or the global south as you were speaking about Paolo. And so those countries that have gotten their independence and have inherited imported state institutions from former colonial powers where they had right after their independence while well, the international control regime in the 40s, 50s, 60s was building up. They were getting their institution, getting their independence and building their institutions and imposing a system that had nothing to do with the illicit use of some substances on the ground. And we can speak about the plant-based and, and, and mild use of opium, of cannabis in different cultures in Asia, in North Africa, in the Middle East, etc. 
uh, uh, all over the world, of course, in Latin America, <laughs> there's so many different uh, substances that are used culturally and ceremonially, and also for in, 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 in traditional medicine, etc. So the article goes from that point of view of this, and then goes into the analysis of the use of political emotion on these electoral processes already. So to some extent, just to step back, just one second, instead of looking into the issues as being the governance being the power of criminal organization, being infiltrating institutions, this article speaks into the institutions having those bases already for that, for that easy infiltration. And so it is a cycle that works for both. And it is a system that works for both sides. There are benefits. And so there are benefits when, they are, when there is political funding and support for elections, but there's also benefits for the political side when they could just use it as a pawn or as something very repressive to gain voices and play on the political emotion, on the failure of, of, of political opponents and, and reducing the violence in the market or in reducing the visibility of the market, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So to some extent, this is really what the article discusses, and it discusses these issues of how the system works on both sides. So it works for the criminal organizations and it works for the political body on both sides and it and how the basis already of the system, of the international control system, were not adapted for the structures of these countries that were getting their independence at the time the, 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 the international, system, international drug control system was being built. And this is exactly uh, seven minutes, <laughs> uh, Claudia, and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your perfect time, uh, Khalid, and thank you for this very good summary of the publication, this overview, and also uh, to, to make some highlights considering your own article on, the, on this edition. So next I will uh, ask uh, Andrea Galassi, and uh, to take the, the, the floor, please. And welcome again, Andrea, it's a pleasure. Okay, <laughs> okay, Claudia, thank you. So uh, for me, it's a big pleasure to be here. Thank you, Paulo, for the invitation. It's very nice to be with Luis Guilherme also. And I'm gonna control my time. <laughs> uh, so I'm gonna give you, uh, a brief overview of medical cannabis in Brazil and the urgent need to regulate this kind of cannabis use. So, different of the main countries in Latin America, like Chile, Colombia, Mexico, and Argentina, where there is some legislation about this topic in Brazil, we have is still being prohibited is still being prohibited to grow marijuana for medical purpose, also for adult social use. So, and what do we have? So we have facilitation in the import process in terms of the bureaucracy required by our, our National Health Surveillance Agents, Anvisa. We have also in 2017, approval of the first registration in Brazil of a medication with cannabis. The name of the, the, the medication is Mevatil. In 2018, we have the approval of the production and marketing of marijuana-based medicine in the country, but to grow in Brazilian soil is still being prohibited. And in 2020, we had the approval uh, to sell in pharmacies the cannabid cannabidiol uh, produced in Brazil by the, the Brazilian pharmaceutical industry. So the problem with these uh, uh, advances that supposes an advance uh, is resting uh, in the price to get access of this medication. It's very expensive to buy this medication to do the, the importation process. So that's uh, uh, for a while is our uh, big uh, issue uh, related to get access of uh, medical cannabis. So, and in 2018, the last year, so the country had the first authorization to import cannabis based products for research purpose. 
that is the clinical trial that I have been conducting at the university. Uh, with the, the title is the study of the viability, safety, and short-term results of cannabidiol for crack cocaine disorders. So that is the, the overview in terms of to get access and uh, how the, the research has been going in our country. So in terms of judicial authorization, so we have around two uh, hundred decisions in favor to grow marijuana for medical purpose. Also, we have one association in northeast of the country in Paraíba State with the name is Abras that uh, uh, is, is like Embrace. Uh, the name is Brazilian Association to Support Cannabis in free translation. With authorization by law to grow marijuana and distribute it to associate patients. Uh, in the parliament, we have the bill that legalizes the cultivation of cannabis in Brazil for medical and industrial purpose. And the discussion uh, about this project is moving forward. And our expectation is that uh, gonna be approved. That's what we, we have in terms of expectation. Of course, the text of the, the project is not what we would like, you know, but it's a, 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 a small step to advance in this uh, matter, in this matter uh, uh, in our country. So, but in the other hand, we had approved in the last year, a new, that's not really new drug law, which facilitates the use of involuntary admissions for drug users, mainly in therapeutic communities, that is a, a religious uh, organization, private organization, where people stay there for a, 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 a long time, you know. Uh, so also we had approved in 2017 the new drug policy. So we have the new law in the new drug policy, uh, which the harm reduction is a very, you know, very uh, concerned uh, aspect of uh, this uh, new resolution policy and law, uh, that the harm reduction approach has been removed of the text of the new drug policy, considering that it's a kind of treatment that competes with the abstinence approach. Uh, the other um, the other problem of this new drug policy is that the psychiatry hospital, which has a historical rights violation in Brazil, and since 2002, we are uh, decreasing uh, the number of the beds and the investing in community-based treatment. So, and this kind of treatment in psychiatry hospital returns in the new drug policy uh, as a, an option, a new option, the old option of treatment in combination, of course, with the uh, uh, treatment offered by the community, the therapeutic community, as I, I just uh, said. So the problem is that our, our uh, community-based treatment uh, in Brazil, the name is CAPS, uh, the, uh, this kind of facilities that is community-based. So the, the CAPS uh, has been uh, in second plan, the background of the policy with uh, less resource and uh, uh, while the psychiatry hospital and the uh, therapeutic community have been receiving much more resource uh, to delivery drug treatment. So, uh, to conclude, <laughs> uh, there is an urgent need to move forward in studies that investigate the therapeutic effects of cannabis in Brazil, especially uh, also to deliver honest communication about the real problems that involved the prohibition. You know, our, our population needs to understand better all this uh, discussion to be uh, more informed and to give a better uh, opinion about. Uh, however, the political scenario 
highly unfavorable, uh, either due to the disinvestment in scientific research or because of the moral taboo surrounding this theme in Brazil. Our political scenario is very, very unfavorable to move on in this discussion. And the parliament, our parliament must play its role in the Republic and legislate on this topic. So uh, eight minutes, uh, I'm sorry, Claudia, <laughs> but what I, I could uh, uh, explain, could say, uh, and thank you everyone for your attention. Okay, it's okay, Andrea, thank you for keeping the time. Um, thank you for uh, putting us into this, you know, Brazilian, uh, context, Katia from ITTC is asking you to provide us with some uh, website in which the results of your research has been, you know, publicized, or if you could just, you know, share this for us. Okay, thank you so much again. Um, and now, Luis Guilherme Paiva, it's your uh, turn. You have the floor for six to seven minutes. Thank you so much. Thank you, Claudia. Thank you, Paulo, for the invitation. I'm very glad to be here. And um, Andrea, it's always a pleasure to, to be with you in, in these events. Khalid, it, I really enjoyed reading your article and uh, I'd love to have time to, to dialogue with you about it and maybe later. <laughs> uh, but I think your your insights have deep implications in Brazil in the local levels that suddenly became national levels with Bolsonaro election. So I think we should um, talk later about it. Um, well, I'm going to start by uh, issuing a statement that you all know that uh, illegal markets and drug markets are not inherently violent. Associated violence uh, is uh, often derived from the market dynamics and from official repression. Sorry, there is a storm going on in Sao Paulo right now and maybe, I don't know if you are uh, listening to me well, just let me know if you can hear it all. In Brazil, there is a particularity. This is not happening in every country, even in the global south, but in Brazil, the wholesale drug market is much less violent than retail. And even this distinction may be misleading. There are sometimes in a single neighborhood, violent and nonviolent drug retail can coexist. Uh, there is interesting research on this point. I can refer to you later if you are interested. Um, however, the institutional response is totally, utterly unaware of the market, drug market dynamics. And they are totally uncommitted to violence reduction as a goal of drug control. And uh, if you combine this with the systemic racism, both in, in, in police and in the criminal justice, criminal justice system, you can start to understand the appalling situation uh, of major Brazilian urban centers and prisons and uh, uh, murder rates and uh, murder committed by policemen here. Uh, there is obviously a lot of endogenous factors to explain the institutional behavior in Brazil, but uh, I believe we should not underestimate the relevance of the international drug control system in framing local legislation. Uh, as both Paulo and Andrea mentioned, uh, Brazilian drug laws can be traced back to the global drug policy movements. And the 2006 law is a very, um, an actual example of the, the year 2000s uh, dissonance between the softer discourse on drug users, the so-called drug users, and the harder stance against drug traffickers. And maybe explain the 96% increase in uh, uh, drug-related offenses arrests since the enactment of the law. Um, given this situation, uh, I would like to highlight the fact that the international drug control system has long, for many years, incorporated the notion that social precarity 
and the lack of opportunities within the legal economy can be factors for drug trade involvement. Uh, and here I refer to Daniel Brombacher and Sarah David papers. Um, even if we limit uh, the alternative development concept to drug production now, uh, it is based in the assumption that drug policies uh, must address market failures and development issues to effectively incorporate people in the legal markets. Um, this is the basis of crop substitution policies. Um, I don't want here to discuss the failures or successes of rural alternative development. And here I also refer to Julia Buxton paper uh, in the journal. My point is, for decades now, the international drug control system accommodates the notion that persons involved in illicit drug production can be exempted from legal prosecution for economic and development policy reasons. Guys, maybe my energy will just fall because of this rain and uh, I apologize in anticipation for that. Uh, so it will just run. Um, I believe this notion that people can be exempted from uh, legal prosecution can be adequately adapted to encompass people involved in drug trade in urban settings. Um, the Yunga's outcome document indicates a promising direction in chapter seven. Uh, I can refer to that later if you want. Um, I really believe that with a nudge from the international drug control system, there's a promising path ahead developing this new notion. But I'm aware it's long and it will be rough. For a proper development-based policy designed to effectively curb violence associated with the illicit drug markets, um, however, two issues are unavoidable. The first of them, and the harder by far, is the lack of viable economic, legal economic opportunities in the poorer areas of Brazilian cities. Uh, this, um, this economical problem is structural and is connected to the Brazilian endemic inequality and long predates uh, drug uh, market itself. So it's a very complex problem that needs to be addressed. However, to even achieve uh, the, the possibility to, to address this problem, we have another easier, it's not easy, but it's easier uh, problem that is currently the Brazilian legal system cannot formally exempt for criminal prosecution people involved in the illicit drug trade. Um, so I will not uh, uh, present here any solution for the first economic problem. But uh, I would like to, to stress that to consider the, the, the second problem or the, the development of some kind of transitional justice designed to generate incentives for people to disengage from drug trafficking, drug traffic organizations. Um, first, this is a fringe opinion right now, I'm aware of that, but I think it can gain traction if we contextualize this within a broader policy goal, uh, for example, to develop uh, a failed economies within urban, major urban cities. And uh, to conclude, I would like to stress that any development project, especially when you're talking about urban programs, uh, should address, since its foundation, the issue of racial reparation. Black communities have disproportionately suffered the burden of economic precarity in urban settings over policing, over incarceration, homicide rates, extrajudicial killings. And this reality must be recognized as a starting point for any serious economic development plan, including drug regulation. It would be a mistake if we start even start anything um, without committing to this objective. Thank you very much. Sorry for uh, my eight minutes uh, okay. presentation. It's quite fine. Thank you so much, Luis, for your oral intervention. And now I would ask uh, uh, Joanne Cassett uh, to take the, the, the floor. Thank you so much for uh, joining us in this panel. The floor is yours. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, perfectly. 
Great. Thank you so much for including me in this very distinguished panel and thank you for organizing an event in English so I can show uh, that so I don't have to show that the only thing I can say is obrigada. Anyway, um, I am happy to, to be here. I, I wanted to say just to start that uh, COVID-19 has revealed structural inequities and fundamental flaws in public health policy in a lot of countries showing us, for example, that it's sometimes easier for those in power to politicize an issue than it is to base policy on scientific evidence. And of course, we've seen that phenomenon before in drug policy writ large, where we frequently see that well-established science is rejected by policymakers in favor of motivations such as being tough on crime, uh, even when the policies that they espouse are not only ineffective, but deadly for many people. So we have these decades of ill-conceived and wrongly motivated policies on illicit drugs in many countries that have left in their wake an undermining of health, of development, and of human rights that cries out to be rectified. It's very common to hear in UN discussions that everyone is espousing public health approaches to drug policy we really need to scratch the surface of those, um, of those declarations and see what that really means. On this World AIDS Day, December 1st, we do well to remember the continued disproportionate burden of HIV, TB, and hepatitis C that's borne by people who use drugs, and also that it doesn't have to be that way. HIV linked to injection with contaminated equipment has been virtually eliminated as a public health problem in most of the European Union, for example, through serious investment in a broad range of um, harm reduction services combined with what is surely the most important public health measure when it comes to drugs, which is decriminalization or at least depenalization of a range of drug infractions, and I'll come back to that. Injury and death from overdose remain major public health challenges and are likely to continue to be so as fentanyl markets expand in many parts of the world and also as um, the companies that have done so much damage with their unethical marketing of prescribed opioids in the US are spreading their activities as well around the world. The experience of the US, which has seen an, a six-fold increase in opioid overdose mortality in the last 20 years, shows graphically the horrific consequences of bad policy at a time when everything possible should be done to remove barriers to medication-assisted treatment and other kinds of treatment for opioid use disorder, as well as barriers to naloxone availability and use, we instead continue to butt our heads against long-standing, irrational, and highly politicized barriers to these proven services. And the other side of the coin of irrational policy on opioid medicines, of course, is that millions of people experience needless pain and suffering for lack of access to morphine and other opioids for pain management because laws and regulations surrounding medical use of opioids are so onerous. There's an urgent need globally to, to revisit the legal and policy frameworks of palliative care and pain management and the way in which medical professionals are taught and supported to make use of all the pain management tools that should be at their disposal. I suggested earlier that part of the relative public health success of the EU countries is, at least with respect to infectious diseases and overdose, is what we might call effective decriminalization of a range of minor drug offenses. The law in some EU countries may not be quite as explicit as in Portugal and the Czech Republic, on which have decriminalization defined by clear cutoff amounts of drugs possessed or sold. And I know you have your own experience with this in Brazil that I'm keen to, to keep learning more about. But even without decriminalization in the letter of the law, it's rare that people in many EU countries would go to jail for a minor drug infraction. That enables these countries, first of all, to save a lot of money because we know how expensive criminal prosecutions and incarceration are and it also enables them, if they have the political will, rather to offer assistance in housing, health, education, employment, and other services, the absence of which may have contributed to drug use patterns in the first place. 
these policies seem to recognize the truth that it is never and will never be a good idea to imprison someone who lives with a drug use disorders disorder. From the US, we look at these practices with envy as our system continues to allow blacks and low income people disproportionately to have their lives and communities destroyed by mass incarceration fueled by the war on drugs. Indeed, the sorry history of failed drug control in the US shows how easy it is for drug policy not founded on scientifically sound ideas to be twisted into an instrument for racist and classist persecution, which plainly undermines health and development and human rights. The US experience also shows, as has already been suggested, how easy it is for drug control as part of, part of foreign policy to exemplify a very pernicious form of neocolonialism. We're at a moment just now globally where we are challenged both to confront racism and classism in public policy and to re-envision the role of policing and criminal prosecutions generally. Reimagining drug policy really must be part of that reflection and I hope it will be around the world. Health outcomes are only one indicator of what we would achieve in this re-envisioning, but they're an important one. Drug policy can be a leading edge of criminal justice reform. It can embody anti-racist and anti-classist measures. It can also amplify the voices of marginalized people. And all of that could contribute to the public's health and to, sustain and to sustainable development. We really have only to find the way politically. Thanks. Thanks so much, uh, Joanne, for size time. Thank you. Um, so I tried to, to collect some uh, questions, um, some broad questions, and I will try to um, select them and ask you to react in terms of your research uh, agenda. Um, please tell, tell us how this, these questions, you know, equal your research agenda, please. Um, first of all, a question concerning alternative development coming from Diane. Alternative development is one of the themes that comes closest to the so-called social reparation. Uh, but uh, Diane has the impression that this debate is then much more at the international level and she mentions our, you know, on debate, then at the national uh, forum. You agree? And what does it mean? And just uh, uh, putting another aspect of the same discussion uh, into the floor, how can we deal with alternative development when we face uh, vulnerable contexts, which involve uh, racial, gender, economic, and economic inequality, and consequently, we are talking about structural violence. And this certainly does not only involve uh, communities from the global south, but also from the, the global uh, uh, north also. So uh, these are the, the questions posed, but if you want also to react to the others, you know, oral intervention, feel comfortable to do this. In a final in a final round, maybe following the same the same sequence, is it okay for you, Khalid? So please. Thank you very much, Claudia, and thank you very much for for these questions. So just to be uh, clear, we have a whole section, the first section, and I will have to speak on behalf of the colleagues. <laughs> Uh, that have written the articles there on alternative development. But the discussion that we have on alternative development, it is the projects of crop substitution and those are agricultural and rural projects of development that would take out the communities that uh, produce the crops for the plants that are used for illegal drugs uh, to, other, to other crops that are legal, etc. So you can see throughout the research of different colleagues from the history of the alternative development in Asia, from the fact that the alternative development has been uh, sold to Afghanistan, sold to some extent to Afghanistan as the solution to everything when it was the solution to somehow nothing, but also how it, the focus on 
prohibition and unjust eradication without any understanding of the community's needs uh, have have created have created real issues and have not worked anywhere where it was implemented from Bolivia to Colombia to many different places in Latin America, but also in Asia and Myanmar, in Afghanistan, of course, etc. We have also a counter view, of course, from the, 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 the German Development Agency, GIZ, and the, their program on, 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 on development-oriented policies that argue that now with a comprehensive view, you can achieve such a, a, a program. Now, there is many, many views on what is called, to some extent, the most successful program of alternative development, which started in the late 1960s in Thailand. And that was accompanied by infrastructure, but also was accompanied with one of the best growth rates in the country. And also then the capacity to invest and to fund the infrastructure and to give, of course, access to the economic, uh, to, to the legal economy. And when, when it's when it means access, it means physical access, it means education, it means access to good health and primary, just primary care for some extent, etc. Um, we uh, finally, what I wanted to add on this specific question of alternative development also is that we can see, for example, just one of the examples that have been lately seen is the, the program of substitution and eradication that is ongoing in Colombia, for example, where you have through the peace agreement, uh, an agreement where the communities that agree on substitution would come and have a program for funding to, for themselves to receive a stipend for two years of their livelihoods. Nevertheless, the infrastructure plan and the rural pl development plan that is in the peace agreement as well takes about 15 years. So in the meantime, there'll be no roads, there'll be no hospitals, there'll be no uh, schools, etc. So that is to some extent the view of alternative development, but I don't know if that was also linked to the question that was talking more about communities, maybe in the city, etc. And those are other discussions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrea. Please, if you have any comments, final comments also. No, okay. Uh, Luis, are you here still with us? Sorry, <laughs> Claudia, I, I was with the microphone off. Just I am sorry. <laughs> so sorry. I understood you didn't have, sorry. Oh, I, was, I was talking with myself. <laughs> So, uh, no, briefly, uh, so Diane has asked at the chat, the, the chat uh, to comment uh, about the reduction of the participation of academ academic and civil, civil society, society you are yes, right, in yeah. the National Drug Policy Council in Brazil. So it's, uh, it's a very important issue that she brought because that's what uh, is going on in Brazil. So our National Drug Policy Council has been uh, um, almost dissolved for the last two, two years. Uh, yes, in 2017. Yes, because I, I, I was the alternate member of uh, representing the Brazilian Society for the Progress of Science. And, uh, you know, so the, 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 the president of the, the council uh, has removed uh, the, repre the representants and the institution organizations uh, as well. So uh, it's, a, it's a very, very problematic uh, uh, um, change. And it's very important to, to us comment that. Uh, because you know the civil civil uh, representation and the the scientific representation representation in this topic has been have been uh, you know uh, uh, have been uh, removed. We don't have um, space to play uh, of oh, uh, uh, to play to to bring the debate and to move on in terms of uh, drug policy reform. So I think she she wants that I, I say something like that just to to for everyone to know what's going on here. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrea, for addressing another uh, question that appeared in our in our chat. Uh, it's quite challenging to select uh, questions uh, and keep with our time frame. So thank you so much. And then Luis. Uh, uh, 
Do you have any other uh, comments, final remarks? Well, let just me um, address the Diana question on on the, the her impression that the debate on alternative development is is much more uh, an international at the inter international level than at local levels. I think in Brazil, yes, of course, it is. Uh, in fact, what we are proposing, um, what, what what I want to propose here is that we have to adapt an international concept to the national reality of Brazil. Uh, even if we have um, cannabis production in Brazil, um, as a means to reduce violence, I understand we should adapt to this concept for the urban settings. And uh, it won't be easy, but uh, if we take the discussion being done in the international level, and as Khalid mentioned, it refers mostly to crop substitution. Um, I think uh, the Daniel Brombacher article is very interesting uh, when it states how the, the discourse on, on illicit markets is uh, totally unrelated to the effectiveness or the, the, the amount of budget uh, allocated to this uh, initiative. So I guess uh, this is something that should be taken into account at this point. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Joanne. Uh, your final remarks and reactions to the, to the questions maybe. Thank you. You have storms in uh, Sao Paulo. I have ambulances here in New York. Uh, <laughs> sorry for the noise. Um, Yes, thank you for the questions and Diana um, is, is a very active questioner and thank you for mentioning that you read my work. I always think that no one reads it except my mother and my mother died recently so I think nobody reads it. But anyway, um, I appreciate that. On the matter of um, the drug conventions and you, you pick out a, a point of what I think is pure hypocrisy in the, in the drug conventions that they're, they're there to promote public health and well-being. Um, I think that was a way to move the discussion forward when the drug conditions were being um, formulated and a way to promote unity around them. They clearly are not about public health um, and the, especially not in the way that they have been, I think, distorted somewhat in the narrative that the US and other countries have created around the conventions and what they really say. I encourage you to read the work of John Collins who also contributed to the, to the special issue because um, John essentially is making the point in many ways that there's probably a lot more flexibility in these conventions than might first appear. And especially that, that would appear if all you listen to is the way that the US over the years and others have, have, um, have, have depicted what's in the conventions. The US, I mean, the US situation is so funny now because of course with legalization of marijuana and now with the first statewide true decriminalization of drug, minor drug offenses in Oregon that just happened in our presidential election, um, we have countries that think that the US comes to the Commission on Narcotic Drugs in violation of the, of the conventions and all of a sudden we have the US experts interpreting the conventions in a much more flexible way than was the case as they have used um, narco foreign policy as a as a way to beat countries up. So yes, I think we are not talking really about public health in the conventions, though we could be. And it cl is clear that these conventions need badly to be revisited. They come from an era um, where the rest of the world really isn't anymore. But anyway, um, on, on um, Dr. Silva from Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka I, I think it is very hard to, to know how to initiate these dialogues. When I worked for the Global Drug Policy Program of the Open Society Foundations, we tried to address this particular challenge by documenting the positive experiences of countries that have taken progressive measures around drug control and sh sh to show that their societies have not fallen apart. And in fact, I, in so doing, I think that um, the US experience is also really interesting. There's no more repressive country when it comes to drug control. And yet we see that because of state uh, level power, 
um, we are seeing changes in drug policy that are important and that will be important living experiments. Um, in the series that we did, and the Global Commission on Drug Policy, of course, has great materials and Khalid maybe will want to speak to that, but um, in, the, in the countries that we wrote up in, in OSF about their drug policy experiences and we tried to write in detail how decisions were made, how how public opinion also changed from being very uh, wary of loosening drug control measures uh, to, to, to other kinds of views. Uh, we unfortunately didn't have any Asian countries except Hong Kong, which may be different enough from Sri Lanka so that it's not helpful. But uh, I think, um, you know, the, the Thai experience, for instance, which is not perfect by any means, but has shown the importance of harm reduction in some ways, the importance of allowing people who use drugs to organize the Vietnamese experience around methadone. I think we can we can find all kinds of examples. And if you want to contact me separately about that, um, that would be fine. OK, thank you. Thank you so much, Professor uh, Joanne. Thank you for addressing another question that appeared in our in our Zoom chat. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have uh, enough time for another uh, uh, round of questions, and I am uh, uh, sorry for that. But the 12th special edition is completely available for free in the website of International Development Policy Journal. Uh, so uh, if you can, you can also address your questions directly to the speakers by contacting them through uh, email if you want. I'm sure they will kindly answer you. So I'd like to thank you all for joining us in this panel. Uh, all the recording of our event will be made available for the International Development Policy staff and you also receive a follow-up satisfaction survey if you can answer it would be really good for us to evaluate the the event uh, thank you again for our speakers paulo thank you so much for dealing with the whole thing the whole uh, bureaucracy and putting this uh, uh, agenda into a, a very qualified discussion thank you so much